It's finally time. It's been what? It's been what, a year and some change since I dropped the Dark Tournament video? Which has become my most popular video by far. Not that that's a high bar to clear. I know what you're probably thinking. Who is this loser and why is he so handsome? First of all, thank you, I needed that today. Second, since this was a pretty highly requested video, I figured I'd throw in some extra personality and finally add a face to the name. So hello, I am Saturn, a professional dumpster fire that posts with the same consistency as an AOL internet connection. I'm unsure of how many of you are old enough to understand that joke, but for those of you on the younger side, I assure you it was very funny. Last time we were here, we had a long chat about the Dark Tournament and why I love it so much, but after sitting down to rewatch and analyze Chapter Black for this video, I think I may have a new favorite. I know that may be hard to hear for some of the diehard Dark Tournament fans, especially considering all of the praise I heaped on it in my last video essay, but by the end of this video I'm hoping that maybe I will have pivoted your opinion by just a tiny bit. The structure of this video is going to be largely similar to how the Dark Tournament video essay was, but there are going to be instances where I'm going to give you information out of order so that I can better explain why I feel the way I feel about certain character arcs or story beats. On top of that, I do intend to skip over things for the sake of time, because otherwise this video would be three hours long, but also because I want to leave some surprises in there for people that do intend to still go on to watch Chapter Black after consuming this video. So if there's a moment in Chapter Black that you love that wasn't mentioned in this video, it's probably for one of those reasons. There will also be time codes in the description below for those of you that need to leave and come back, which I do recommend if you haven't seen the Chapter Black arc in Yu Yu Hakusho because this video is going to contain heavy spoilers. If you care about spoilers, go watch episodes 67 through 94, which covers the prelude all the way up to the aftermath of Chapter Black. Once you're done, just tune back in. Lastly, I just want to say thank you to everyone that stuck around and waited patiently for this video to come out. It means a lot to me and I hope the video was well worth the wait. Speaking of which, how long is this video? Well, I think you should probably grab a snack and settle in. Also, if you stick around to the very end, I'll tell you a brief story about how this video was almost sponsored by Loot Crate. Bet that's a name you haven't heard in a while. When the story picks back up, a couple of months have passed since the conclusion of the Dark Tournament. Things are relatively calm and quiet in the aftermath of the Spear Detective's victory over the ferocious Tagoro brother, but that victory has kind of put Yusuke in a state of perpetual boredom. The high stakes of the life or death battles are a far cry from the drab mundanity of a school day. Kuwabara shows some real concern for Yusuke's melancholic behavior, but when Yusuke expresses that he feels like he's got nothing left to challenge him, that pretty quickly dashes Kuwabara's concern. In fact, Kuwabara's got his own troubles in the wake of the tournament. His spirit energy seems to be completely MIA just completely absent for no discernible reason. Elsewhere in town, while doing their own things, both Kurama and Hiei notice the presence of demon insects, which doesn't bode well for things to come. At some point, Botan shows up during the school day to tip Yusuke off to another potential case, but before she can, she heads out to avoid having to explain who she is to teachers. At the conclusion of the school day, Yusuke goes to leave, still in a pretty foul mood. Catching him in the hallway, Keiko straps Pooh to Yusuke's back, which doesn't exactly reinforce his bad boy image. But after getting low-key roasted by Keiko, Yusuke allows her to do what she wants. Kuwabara encourages him to stay, but naturally, he doesn't. Unbeknownst to Team Yurameshi, they're being targeted by a trio of humans that give off some pretty sus vibes. On his way out for the day, Yusuke is confronted by the three mysterious humans, looking to pick a fight with him specifically. Still harboring some pent-up frustration from the lack of any real action going on in his life, Yusuke decides to fight the one that seems to be the mouthpiece of the group, Kido. Considering who he's up against, Yusuke is basically already saying GG. A fight against a human? That wouldn't even be considered a workout for Yurameshi. Soon, Kido requests for Yusuke to unstrap the creature he has secured to his bag. Demonstrating that he's aware Poo is a living thing and not just some stuffed animal is enough to finally command Yusuke's full attention and curiosity. By this point, Yusuke still doesn't realize that he'd voluntarily walked right into a trap. Kido manifests what will become to be known as a territory, and uses this newly introduced power to step on Yusuke's shadow, completely paralyzing him. So that I don't have to explain it later on when the story does, a territory is a physically created space-time that has different traits depending on the human psychic using it. Some territories cover vast distances, some are internal, some can directly influence others as well, and some only affect their user. Because territories have different functions, some can be dispelled by the user at will, some can be dispelled if the user is rendered unconscious, while some can only be dispelled after certain conditions are met. 
The death of the psychic also negates the territory, but depending on the rules of the territory, that might not even be possible. Anyway, after Yusuke is captured, Pooh goes into a panic and flies off to find Kuwabara, who is chatting with Botan about why she had shown up earlier. Turns out she was going to have Yusuke investigate strange energy readings that keep popping up before quickly disappearing. Pooh swoops in to literally spell out what happened and leads the pair to the field where Yusuke's bag and a note are waiting. The note states that they're to go to an old estate at midnight, but interestingly, it requires Hiei, Kurama, and Kuwabara to be among the attendees. It's alarming for an unknown enemy to not only get the upper hand on Yusuke, but to also know enough about Team Yurameshi to be aware of the existence of Kurama and Hiei. After gathering the necessary parties, Team Yurameshi heads to a pretty ridiculous looking estate where a warning is posted on the door prohibiting any of them from saying the word hot upon entrance. Upon entering this territory, everyone inside must adhere to the rules set by the psychic that conjured it. In this case, that rule would be the word hot is considered taboo, and the psychic waiting to greet them is one of the three humans that ran up on Yusuke, a guy named Kaito. From how he is introduced before all of this goes down, we're already aware that he's a fellow student at Kurama School that harbors something of a grudge and an inferiority complex in regard to our favorite fox boy. It's clear that he doesn't necessarily care about anyone else in Team Yurameshi except Kurama. Even the rule of the territory is designed as a battle of wits to try and finally defeat him at something. Hiei, being the reckless dickhead he is, attempts to attack Kaito only to realize the secondary rule of the territory is that violence isn't permitted. There's no inherent punishment for attempting to break this rule, but the would-be target of any assault is instantly shielded by a protective barrier. Keeping up his recklessness, Hiei purposely says the word hot out of spite and promptly has his soul removed from his body, which then establishes the victory conditions for the game they're playing. The game is over when Kaito has successfully collected all of their souls, or if he himself has his soul extracted. Cleverly, Kaito keeps the room the game is taking place in hot and humid, kind of like an unconscious way of chipping away at Team Yurameshi's fortitude. Kuwabara ends up having his soul removed after making the mistake of saying the words each other, which on first glance doesn't make sense, right? Except it does technically fall into the rules because Kaito didn't clearly explain the game to his opponents. He purposely held back information that they needed, placing them at a severe disadvantage. As the rules truly go, it isn't just the word hot that they needed to refrain from speaking, it was any instance of words in which the letters H-O-T line up consecutively. If you look again at the words each other, smack in the middle are those letters lined up perfectly. As the audience and as the members of Team Yurameshi, this comes across as unfair and also complete horseshit, but that lack of information is kind of the entire point, as we'll swing back around to in a few minutes. Botan, in a justifiable protest, yells out that Kuwabara didn't even say the word hot, only realizing her mistake right after making it. So in the span of 10 seconds, Team Yurameshi has dropped from 3 remaining players to just Kurama. With 3 trophies in hand, Kaito makes a remark about scratching the souls of Team Yurameshi, but Kurama shuts that down by rolling a nat 20 on his intimidation check. I'm warning you, you so much as bruise what's in your hand and I'll show you pain. The hue of your soul will cease to matter because you will not be judged when you die. Realizing that neither person would say the taboo word, Kurama asks if it's possible to change the game. Kaito confirms it and Kurama proposes a new, more difficult game of diction that also comes with a time limit. He says that he'll force Kaito to speak the taboo before time runs out, and if he fails to do so, he'll willingly give Kaito his soul as well. Kaito agrees to the new challenge and the rules of the territory are changed. Kurama plays it smart and bides his time, nearly running out the clock until an opportunity appears. Kaito goes off to use the bathroom and upon his return, Kurama has used his botanical powers to completely fill the room with plants. By keeping out of sight, Kurama places a sense of anxiety and anticipation on Kaito's shoulders, who's expecting the spirit fox to try to catch him off guard with a jump scare. We don't get to see it, but Kurama uses a silly face to make Kaito laugh, which causes him to break his own taboo and lose the game. The next obstacle standing between the team and rescuing Yusuke is presented to them by the last of the strange trio, Yanagisuwa. Each member of Team Yurameshi is tasked with walking up one of the many staircases by themselves. Understanding that splitting the party in this situation is a profoundly dangerous stipulation, Botan offers up the use of some spirit tools to aid them. Basically, these tools act like badges and when placed on someone, cannot be removed by anyone except the one that placed it there. It also reflects the overall health status of the person who placed it with a simple green, yellow, red system. If the one who placed this sticker were to die, this sticker would just fall off on its own. The members of Team Yurameshi each take four, write their names on them, and then stick them to their teammates so that they can monitor each other while being separated. What's amusing though is that initially, Hiei refuses to allow the others to place the silly looking badges on him, but when Kurama reminds him that he was the first to lose his soul, he reluctantly backs down. 
Proceeding up their own staircases, each member ends up dealing with some spatial oddities, but aside from that, there's nothing major. Once they emerge on the second floor, they find Yusuke still trapped by Kido, who initiates the final challenge for the spirit detective and his allies. Kido announces that one of Yusuke's teammates is an imposter, as someone has been apprehended and replaced by Yana on their way up the stairs. He tells Yusuke that he has a limited amount of time to discern who the imposter is, and if he fails, whomever they've taken hostage will be killed. Yusuke fires off a few questions for his allies to suss out who the imposter could be, and then notices the badges that they're all wearing. Thinking they've found a clever solution to their problem, they each grab hold of one, preparing to pull them free, the logic being that the imposter wouldn't be able to remove the tag with their name on it. However, Kido tells them that the power afforded to Yana by his territory is the power to completely copy someone he touches, from their physical appearance to their mannerisms and memories all the way down to the signature of their spirit energy. His perfect duplication would be more than enough to subvert their attempt to oust him. After that failure, Yusuke's time to determine who was the imposter comes to an end and Kido instructs him to punch the person he suspects as hard as he can. The only way to force Yana's power to shut off involuntarily was to render him unconscious, and with the penalty for failure being that the captured ally would be killed, Yusuke couldn't afford to pull his punches. Going with his gut, Yusuke designates Kuwabara as his target and lays him flat. Fortunately, it was the correct choice. Yusuke's logic was that neither Kurama nor Hiei would be so easy to catch off guard, and while Botan was the only non-fighter, Yusuke was sure their enemy wouldn't have been stupid enough to piss him off by taking advantage of the only one there that was technically incapable of defending herself, which left Kuwabara as the safest bet. After the excitement dies down, Kido offers to introduce Team Urameshi to the true mastermind behind that night's events, which turns out to be Genkai. The entire encounter with Kido's crew from start to finish was designed to teach the group a lesson about perception. Genkai needed them to understand that despite each of them being a gifted fighter in their own right, there would come a time when they would need to rely on their ability to perceive and analyze information. With the exception of Kurama, Team Urameshi isn't exactly known for relying on much more than their brute strength, and that over-reliance would quickly become a burden if not kept in check, as demonstrated by Yusuke himself. Yusuke, even with as far as he's come since the opening of the series, is still exceedingly reckless and hasty for his own good. He remarks that Kido never would have caught him so easily had he known about his shadow gimmick, but that's exactly Genkai's point. Yusuke didn't know that his enemy was capable of such a thing or that he had powers to begin with, so Yusuke underestimated them and overestimated himself. Rushing into a situation without an understanding of what the enemy can do is tantamount to a death sentence, so it was pretty fortunate for Yusuke that everything was being puppeteered by Genkai to teach him this lesson in a controlled and otherwise safe way. We learn that someone has been carving out a tunnel to the demon world, essentially continuing Sakio's plan from the Dark Tournament. The energy that's bleeding into the human world from the creation of this tunnel is what's causing humans like Kido, Kaito, and Yana to awaken to and develop their psychic abilities. At least 30 humans have gone to Genkai for help and every single one of the affected have come from Mushiori City, where the tunnel is located. The breach in the Veil of Human World opens into something known as the Pseudo Space, which acts as a kind of zone between worlds and looks like something out of Tron. Unlike the breach that's currently forming, most openings into and out of the pseudo space tend to close quickly and are exceedingly rare. Koenma and the others in Spirit World are aware of the growing breach and recognize that there are periodic fluctuations in the pseudo space's barrier. What's alarming though, according to one of the Reapers in the Loop, is that even in humanity's next dark age, which isn't scheduled for another several centuries, there wouldn't be a hole in the pseudo space as large as the one currently forming. It's soon after this that Koema contacts Team Urameshi to give them, and by proxy us, the breakdown on what to expect. The tunnel breach can be categorized into four distinct stages. Stage 1. Demon energy becomes more abundant in the human world, which allows demon parasites like the insects seen by Kurama and Hiei to thrive. Stage 2. As the size of the breach increases, normal humans find themselves awakening to supernatural abilities. Considering the presence of Kido, Kaito, and Yana, it's already well established that this is the stage currently underway. Stage 3. The demonic energy thickens in the human world, allowing lower class monsters to spawn at will. The creatures that spawn aren't terribly strong or even all that intelligent, but that deficiency is overshadowed by their hunger for violence. Lastly, there's stage 4. The breach stabilizes with a diameter of 2 kilometers, allowing unrestricted access for demons strong enough to be categorized as B-class. Though Spirit World has a system for categorizing demons by strength, this is the first time Yusuke is hearing about it because up until this point, it hasn't necessarily been relevant in terms of the work he's done as Spirit Detective. The rankings go from E-Class down at the bottom of the barrel, up to as high as the classified S-Class. For a barometer of what a demon's strength can look like based on their class, Team Urameshi is blindsided and completely taken aback by the fact that despite how hard they struggled, 
and how powerless they felt against him, Tagoro was only considered an upper B-class demon. For additional context, at the beginning of the series, when Hiei fought Yusuke for the first time, he was only considered to be in the upper ranks of the D-class. However, as of the end of the Dark Tournament, Hiei now hovers around the middle B-class, so it's safe to say that not only does the letter of your category matter, where you fall within the hierarchy of that category also matters. Following this revelation, we learned about the Kakai Barrier, which is essentially a net inside the pseudospace that prevents A and S class demons from traveling to the human world, but allows just enough give for B class demons and lower to squeeze through. The Kakai Barrier is a massively important plot item, so it's important that you know what it is and how it works. Understandably, Yusuke is outraged by the notion that the barrier would allow for demons of the same class as Tagoro to pass into human world, but Koema expresses how nightmarish it would be for even one S-class demon to make its way through. It would essentially be hell on earth for humanity. To make matters even worse, Team Irameshi finds out that they only have three weeks before the tunnel reaches stage four. In order to stop the tunnel from forming, they need to locate and defeat the psychic at its center, fueling its growth. Genkai poses they find the answers to three questions before doing anything reckless. How many fighters are in their group? Who is their leader? And what is the nature of their powers? She reiterates that attacking without that knowledge would be suicide, again reinforcing the lesson she'd gone to so much trouble to teach Team Urameshi. Kobar has to be clued in retroactively since without his spirit powers, he can't hear what Koima is saying through the briefcase. He takes the bad news about as well as you'd expect. My life! He's just starting, there's still things I need to do! I need to marry a girl, grow my first mustache! Hiei pieces out though. I mean, it's Hiei, what else do you expect from him? In this episode, we also get a peek at the story arc's primary antagonist, Shinobu Sensui, as well as a pretty solid bit of insight into his intentions. Interestingly, he's also in possession of what remains of the elder Togoro brother, who we're just going to refer to as the definitive Togoro in this video because he's the only one left. Tagoro is still recovering from what his brother did to him at the end of the Dark Tournament, and he pretty clearly wants to get revenge on Team Urameshi. We're also given a glimpse of Sensui's subordinates, who I'll go ahead and introduce now so that when they show up later, I won't have to drop everything and introduce you. First up is Matari, codename Seaman. His territory grants him the ability to summon beasts from pools of water by mixing his blood with it. The more blood he introduces into the water source, the bigger the creature that comes forth. The inside of his creatures are also essentially a wholly separate dimension, so an enemy that is consumed would have no hope of escape. Next is Kamiya, codenamed Doctor. His territory is large enough to engulf the entire hospital he's employed at. Within his territory, he can summon insects that normal people can't see, and these insects can inject victims with a potent toxin that can be fatal if the territory isn't banished. On top of that, Kamiya can harness his spear energy into his fingertips like scalpels, allowing him to mutilate those who get in his way. Lastly, his newfound powers enable him to alter his body chemistry at will to do things like shut off pain receptors, increase the adrenaline in his system, and so on. Number 3 is Hagare, codenamed Sniper. His territory has several ins and outs to it. First and foremost, he can use telekinesis to hit his target with any object of his choice from 500 yards away. He can even coat relatively soft objects with his energy to increase their hardness before launching them. When taken to the extreme, he can mark his target with several bullseyes, and when he does, any object lobbed at the victim will pursue them until they connect even without direct or extended input from Sniper. After that comes Amanuma, codename Game Master. His territory gives him the ability to manifest any video game of his choice in the physical world, so long as he has the cartridge for it. When manifesting a game, the rules of the game become the rules of the territory. For now, I'll leave it at that as we'll be coming back to this later. Moving on, we come to Makihara, whose name I had to look up, codename Gourmet. As was the case with Amanuma, I'll cycle back to this one later since it's more interesting to generally discuss this character as he becomes relevant to the arc. Lastly, we finish with Itsuki, codename Gatekeeper. He's the psychic at the center of the portal, compelling it to grow. There's a little bit more to his character that we'll cover later, but for now, just know that he's the one doing the heavy lifting on behalf of the antagonist. Considering the success and fan reception of the Dark Tournament, I can definitely say that I don't envy the position that author Yoshihiro Togashi found himself in. Up to this point in the series, the Dark Tournament and the Togoro Brothers had dominated nearly two-thirds of the entire episode count. The villain was compelling to the same degree he was daunting, and Yusuke had a complete emotional arc that culminated in pretty satisfying conclusion. How do you even begin to follow something like that up? I think the answer and most logical route to take would be to change the nature of the adversity that Yusuke and his allies face. In the Dark Tournament, many of the factors determining Yusuke's stress were external, but also tied to his growth as a warrior. The threat of death if he or his friends lost a match or backed out of a fight, 
the endless meddling of the Black Black Club, the many faces that stood between him and the finals, and then the younger Togoro brother himself, all of these could have been mitigated if Yusuke had just been physically stronger. Every problem he had was tied to the fact that there was someone directly involved that could punch harder than him. So to overcome these trials, it became his sole goal to improve as a warrior. Power was the name of the game. Chapter Black takes Team Yurameshi in a different direction by asking them not what happens when they aren't physically strong enough to punch their problems away, but what do they do when they aren't clever enough to outwit their enemy, and what do they do when their enemy forces them into situations that challenge their sense of morality? Do you hold tight to your moral righteousness at the expense of countless innocents, or do you relinquish them in favor of the greater good? What is the legacy we leave behind when our time is done, and how does that legacy affect the people that have chosen to follow us? Chapter Black really takes the time to dive into these questions and play with them in ways that are refreshing after the rigid but still enjoyable structure of the Dark Tournament. <laughs> After being clued in by Koenma about the gravity of the new case, Team Yurameshi splits into two groups in order to canvas and investigate Mushiori City for any sign of the ones responsible for the tunnel to Demon World. Karama leads one team to investigate the site where the center of the distortion should be, but it's just an empty field with nothing out of the ordinary. They postulate that if what they're looking for isn't on the surface, then it must be below ground. Having keen senses, Karama realizes that they're being watched, but upon closer inspection, there appears to be no one present. Most people would just brush it off, but Karamo is sure they were being pursued and realizes that the enemy must already know who they are and that they're on the move. So as a precaution, Karamo decides that their safest play would be to reconvene with Yusuke's group. Speaking of Yusuke's group, they're out strolling through a different portion of the city when they all experience the sensation of having walked into someone's territory. Considering territories should be relatively rare, they proceed into a small drinking establishment hoping to find a lead. What they find is an aspiring boxer named Moroda who knows they're looking for him because his territory grants him the ability to read minds. What's interesting about Moroda is that in terms of everyone involved in this story arc, he's the only one that isn't necessarily interested in a quest to save or destroy the world. With his territory, all he wants to do is become a successful boxer and rake in the dough. He figures with his power, he'll always know what his opponent was planning and could easily climb through the ranks. Compared to everyone else's motivations, it's very pedestrian and I do wish that we were given more examples of random characters unrelated to the plot that just wanted to do random things with their new powers. Anyway, Yusuke and the others can't be sure if Moroda is telling the truth about his power, nor can they be sure who he is aligned with, if anyone. So they intend to let Yana copy him, which will let Yana sift through his memories for anything suspicious. Moroda has no intention of complying with them and to confirm if his claims of reading minds are true, Kido attempts to step on his shadow while purposely thinking about how stepping on Moroda's shadow will trap him. Naturally, Moroda moves just enough for Kido to miss his shadow and then proceeds to beat the crap out of him. Eventually, Yusuke steps in and uses Moroda's over-reliance on his power in a very clever way. The only way I'll hit you is with a straight right jab. Huh? But chances are I'll stop short. But stop, stop short, short just short. before just I hit his I face. face. I'll throw a I'll straight throw a right jab. <laughs> We get two things from this victory. We can see just how strong Yusuke is compared to his colleagues versus how he was even at the beginning of the Dark Tournament, as well as his ability to think on his feet when he has the information he needs to form a battle plan. Moroda passes Yana's test, and Yusuke's group convinces him to help them search the thoughts of passers-by for anything that might help them. He can pick up on every thought within 30 yards of him, and the more intense the thought, the louder he hears it. It isn't long before he picks up on the hideously dark thoughts of Sensui, who makes his appearance to our protagonist for the first time. However, when he turns to face them, Moroda is suddenly struck in the forehead by something small and fast, akin to a gunshot. In the time it took for Yusuke's group to return their attention to Sensui, he was already gone, so instead they focused on rushing Moroda to the hospital where he does make a recovery. You might be wondering how this normal human could just shrug off a gunshot to the forehead, but that's the interesting part. Moroda wasn't shot at all, what actually struck him was an average pencil eraser. Genkai and Yusuke both realized that Sensui wasn't the one that fired the shot because it came from 5 feet to his right. According to Genkai, when she attempted to trace it back to its point of origin, she ultimately failed but noticed that it came from over 500 yards away. As you can likely guess, Sniper was the one that let loose the item. This interaction is also the first glimpse we get at just how meticulous Sensui is when it comes to coordinating operations with the subordinates compared to the haphazard way Team Yurameshi goes about things. It also shows us that both we and Karama were correct in assuming the enemy already knows exactly who Yusuke and his crew are. But genuinely the most fascinating thing to come from this is when Genkai commends Yusuke on keeping his cool and not pursuing Sensui right away. Yusuke admits that the reason he didn't follow after the man was because he sent something dangerous about him and was afraid. 
This is a low-key huge moment because keep in mind, Yusuke is fresh off the heels of his biggest victory as a spirit detective and is stronger than he's ever been. For him to hesitate and to voice that hesitation shows that on some level, he's internalized Genkai's lesson about perception and not relying solely on his fists to solve problems. I like to believe this reaction is also somewhat related to his newfound knowledge of Spirit World's power classes and that his toughest enemy to date wasn't even in the highest tier. Before he'd learned that fact, he just assumed he was the new top dog and that nothing could challenge him. That belief was part of the reason he was so agitated at the beginning of the arc. With that belief shattered so thoroughly, it's not unreasonable to think he's assumed their new enemy must be at the very least on par with a full strength Tagoro or slightly above that. Genkai and Yusuke come to the realization that if everyone under Sensui's umbrella is as strong and capable as Sniper has already demonstrated himself to be, then they're in some pretty deep trouble. It's also around this time that Moroto relays the codenames of Sensui's crew, and Genkai correctly hypothesizes that their codenames must be hints or references to what their territories can do. What they failed to realize, though, was that by bringing Moroto to the hospital, they had inadvertently wandered into Dr. Kamiya's territory, who has already set his sights on them. Team Yermeshi go on high alert after the familiar sensation of a territory expanding washes over them, and just as quickly, Yana and Moroto are bitten by the unusual insects that are native to the Doctor's space-time. Their skin turns almost a Listerine green and flu-like symptoms set in at a pretty horrifying rate. With swarms of these plague-bearing insects on the loose and normal humans still unable to see them, Yusuke, Genkai, and Kido set out to find the doctor and incapacitate him. They have a working theory that Kamiya might not be an actual doctor, instead posing as one, so they split up to try to find hospital staff that might recognize an unfamiliar or out-of-place physician. Kido is unfortunate enough to be the one to run into Kamiya who approaches Kido as he's soliciting help from a nurse. The nurse mentions that she was sure Kamiya was supposed to be off that day, alerting Kido that something was out of the ordinary. Within the blink of an eye, Kamiya has already used his powers to cripple Kido, completely paralyzing him. The nurse gets got after she screams at the unfolding carnage. In order to regain the upper hand and avoid suspicion, Kamiya slices one of Kido's wrists and then when another nurse shows up claims that someone else running around impersonating a doctor committed the act, effectively taking Kido's assumption from earlier and using it as his own alibi. It's a quick-witted response to an emergency situation that shows that their enemy can be just as clever as they are dangerous. When Yusuke arrives on the scene alerted by the scream of the nurse Kamiya cut down, he's unable to ascertain the information he needs to act since Kido's fresh injuries leave him unable to communicate in a meaningful way. Yusuke goes to leave to continue his search, but in a moment of desperation, Kido cleverly opens his territory to grab hold of the spirit detective Shadow and hold him in place, essentially screaming in silence for Yusuke to realize that the enemy was nearby. In a really cool variance of his power, Kido uses his own shadow to scribble out the culprit's name using the blood on the floor. I would have liked to see this ability used again down the road, but oh well. This kind of deviation from what we already know about the territories of psychics could have opened the door for some seriously entertaining battles or games of cat and mouse. And once Kato gets Kamiya's name out there, the maniac immediately cuts down the other doctors in the vicinity and all hell breaks loose as he squares off with Yusuke. With his cover blown in front of his ultimate enemy, the insects in the hospital begin making short work of the civilians gathered within the building. The only ones left standing are Yusuke, Kamiya, and Genkai. Everyone else has fallen victim to the unique toxin of Kamiya's own creation. Yusuke pummels Kamiya and lays him flat, but much to his surprise, the doctor just gets back up and takes off running. Yusuke and the doctor go another round, and that's when Yusuke discovers that the enemy can alter his body chemistry to enhance his performance. By pumping adrenaline through his system to make himself faster, to cutting off his ability to feel pain, Kamiya made himself a much tougher enemy for Yusuke to deal with since he seemingly couldn't get incapacitated and the infected civilians in the hospital were on borrowed time. What's even wilder is when Yusuke uses a shot from his handy dandy spirit gun to take off one of Kamiya's arm and the mad lad just casually reattaches it and fixes the clothing too, I guess? On a brief side note, one of my favorite things about this showdown with Kamiya is the use of thick shadows to create a very distinct atmosphere. There's something suffocating about the darkness when paired with Kamiya's crazed actions. In a strange way, it kind of symbolizes the overall themes of this arc by keeping Yusuke entrenched firmly in what little light there is to be had in this situation while Kamiya is more than happy to run off into the darkness and give in to his psychopathic and misanthropic tendencies. But the shadows that do find themselves cast upon Yusuke are indicative of Sensui and his team's desire to pull Yusuke into that same darkness. This is further illustrated when we realize what Sensui's purpose was for using his team to send Yusuke to Kamiya's territory in the first place. He was testing Yusuke's sense of morality. He wanted to see if Yusuke would be willing to take a human life if it meant saving countless others. Remember, up to this point in the story, all of Yusuke's enemies had been demons or apparitions, so he could in a way mentally detach himself from the situation. 
However, all of the enemies standing between him and closing the portal to Demon World are humans, humans enacting a terrible plan that would lead to the complete annihilation of mankind if left unchecked. More than ever, this was a battle to see what it was that Yusuke believed in and if he would sacrifice the integrity of those beliefs for the greater good. With time running out for the victims in the hospital along with a couple of other interesting twists, Yusuke reluctantly steps up and takes the plunge, opting to kill Kamiya for the sake of the civilians that would otherwise die themselves. Not killing humans is what divides Yusuke from his enemies. There's a very clear line in the sand for him as our hero and he knows crossing that line isn't something that he can ever come back from. It's also important to note just how many times Yusuke gave Kamiya a chance to surrender without dying. Yusuke was trying his absolute best to avoid having to go down that route. There's a pair of shots of Yusuke simply staring at his fist, already recognizing and acknowledging the gravity of what he'd just done. It's a sobering moment for the character and the audience. Even though Kamiya was an enemy, and a very dangerous one at that, Yusuke still laments the fact that he had no choice but to kill him. Yusuke has thrown countless punches over the life of this anime, but not once have we seen him stop and regret one of them. There's something to be said about Yusuke valuing the life of an evil human more than an evil demon or apparition, and in its own roundabout way, that heavy emphasis on the value of a human life over that of a demon's is another huge theme of this story arc. Seeing the massive and impossible weight doing such a thing would force Yusuke to carry, Genkai steps in and revives Kamiya. With as much as they still have on their plate, Genkai remarks that they didn't have time for Yusuke to bear that burden and second guess himself in the future, but she also reiterates that he made the right call. This is also the first time we get a glimpse of just how expendable Sensui sees his subordinates. When Seaman brings up the idea that Yusuke could kill Kamiya, Sensui simply replies with, then let him die. He's far more interested in using Kamiya to make a point to Yusuke than ensuring that the doctor walks away from the situation alive. It's not the last time we see this attitude from Sensui and it makes it for a pretty harsh contrast to how Yusuke treats his own allies. This difference in attitude actually bleeds pretty heavily into how the members of each team conduct themselves. You see, Yusuke and Sensui stand in direct opposition to one another in fundamental ways. Where Yusuke sees the good or potential for good in others, Sensui can only see the very worst of others. Where Yusuke values the lives, opinions, and ideologies of his allies and treats them as equals for the most part, Sensui couldn't care less about the safety, well-being, or opinions of his subordinates. He is the leader, and with the exception of Itsuki, Sensui sees the psychics he's recruited as completely and utterly expendable. Yusuke has come to understand that the best way to help his allies survive the hardships ahead isn't just to help them grow physically stronger, but to arm them with actionable information. Sensui is not above sending his subordinates into situations completely blind for the sake of furthering his own schemes. Their leadership styles end up having a direct influence on how their teams engage with both the ones in charge and their fellow teammates, and even the enemy. Nowhere else in the arc is this exemplified more than the showdown between Kuwabara and Matari. Shortly after Dr. Kamiya is dealt with and left for the police, Team Yurameshi is told by Koenma that the center of the distortion was indeed deep underground and that after some recalculating, they have discovered that there was less time until the tunnel stabilized than they thought. The time frame plummets from three weeks down to just one. Fortunately, there is a tunnel system that can lead them to the psychic at the center of the distortion known to the locals as Demon's Door Cave. A pretty apt name. As with the first bit of bad news, Kuwabara has to be filled in after the fact since his spirit powers are still MIA. Naturally, Yusuke finds this news urgent enough to warn immediately heading to Kurama's school to inform him of the change, but Kuwabara splits off because he and his school buddies got floor tickets to see their favorite band playing live. When Kuwabara expresses more interest in seeing the band than handling the ticking time bomb in front of them, Yusuke understandably pitches a fit and the two trade words with each other. Just don't expect me to save your ass when it's demon season. Like I need help from you! I'm so sick of your big man crap! This exchange highlights not only how these two see each other, but how they see themselves. Yusuke, while respecting Kuwabara more on a personal level, still sees him as someone to be rescued instead of someone wholly capable of keeping himself safe. He still harbors the mindset that Kuwabara would be demon fodder if he wasn't around to pick up the slack, putting himself on a bit of a pedestal above Kuwabara. Kuwabara, on the other hand, after surviving not only Rando and the Saint Beast alongside Yusuke, but the Dark Tournament, justifiably sees himself as a capable ally, so it strikes at a nerve to know his best friend doesn't view him in the same manner. Kuwabara is aware there's a vast power gap between Yusuke and himself, but he still finds it hard to stomach Yusuke's arrogance. Keep this exchange in mind because it becomes relevant in a moment. Yusuke, still frustrated with Kuwabara, gets even more annoyed when he reunites with Genkai's group and sees that Kurama skips school and isn't present either. In a bit of a tantrum, he announces that he's going to the arcade. Genkai assumes he's actually just planning to go look for Kuwabara, but... 
Kurama isn't present because he's gone off to Spirit World to confront Koenma, theorizing that the toddler already knows the identity of their true enemy, but hasn't revealed that information for a pretty jarring reason. If I knew who he was, don't you think I would have told you so you could stop him? Perhaps not, if you feared he would defeat us. Keep in mind that even though I'm referring to him by name, Team Urameshi at this time still has no idea who Sensui even is. They've only seen him once for a split second out in a crowded area. Kurama is a very perceptive character, so he's noticed the contradiction in Koenma's behavior. Despite how high the stakes are and the urgency of the mission, Koenma has said pretty much nothing in the way of information that could truly help Team Urameshi. It's something you notice in hindsight. If things were that dire, don't you think there'd be far more communication between the ruler and the detective? A normal person would be throwing every resource they had at the problem, but Koenma's basically been doing all of his work behind the scenes, only giving Yusuke the bare minimum. Meanwhile, After the concert, Kuwabara and his friends are set upon by Matari as the rain pours down on them. If you recall, his powers are more efficient when there's more moisture present, so in the middle of a downpour, he's basically at full strength. Kuwabara is in the exact opposite situation. With his spirit energy on vacation in Tahiti, he's defenseless against the creatures Matari summons from the puddles around him. It isn't long before Matari has Kuwabara's friends trapped inside one of his monsters, which counts as them being in an entirely separate dimension. It's around this time that we're given Matari's backstory and his connection to Sensui through light flashbacks where we see him being ostracized, picked on, and physically bullied by his peers. Over the visuals, we can hear Sensui's voice explaining how Matari's bullies gladly indulged in one of humanity's greatest vices, torture. This tidbit is exceptionally important later. This also clues us in on one of Sensui's methods for flipping otherwise normal people to his side, preying on their insecurities and past suffering. Despite this, we see the difference in mindset between Kuwabara and Matari pretty quickly. Kuwabara insists his adversary let his friends go since he's the one Matari is after and in return, he'll give him a fair fight. Kuwabara, as always, is operating from a place of honor, a very consistent code of conduct. Matari spurns the idea and conveys that he isn't there to compete with Kuwabara, he's there to wipe out humans. Matari is still operating from a place of fear and insecurity, simply wanting to avoid being bullied ever again. He explicitly says, I won't have any elitist groups bullying me anymore. The fear of being the target of harassment, as well as something else we'll discuss shortly, were more than enough for Sensui to twist and manipulate a guy that just needed a helping hand from someone who cared enough to stand up for him. Even Kuwabara can see the hypocrisy in Matari's motivation and promptly calls him out. You're full of it. Saying you got the right because guys bullied you around, but you're just like them now. Matari can't wrap his head around why Kuwabara isn't selfishly running away to save his own life, instead selflessly standing his ground at what could very likely be the expense of his own life. Given his past and personal experiences, the young psychic can't help but believe humans are selfish and vile at their core, so seeing Kuwabara defy that belief only enrages him. Kuwabara ultimately gets absorbed too, and Matari's thinking it's GG, but once Kuwabara's desperation grows, seeing his friends have already lost consciousness, he manages to summon his spirit sword again, but in a new iteration. It's become a blade capable of cutting through dimensions, which affords him the power to free himself from Matari's territory, while also landing a decisive blow. In the midst of this, Matari confirms that the power Kuwabara had awakened to was exactly the power Sensui was looking for, someone capable of destroying the Kakai Barrier, the only thing holding the A and S class demons at bay. Once the battle's over, Kuwabara elects to save Matari despite what he's done to him and his friends, completely and utterly shattering Matari's surface level perception of human nature. When asked why he'd want to save him, Matari is told, Nice cock! <laughs> When men do what they're supposed to do, it's not always about what they want. This reinforces the fact that Kuwabara is always willing to do what's right, even when it directly conflicts with how he's feeling. The code he lives by shapes who he is, and he sticks to it, even when it's difficult. At the same time this is all going on, Genkai chastises Yusuke for actually going to the arcade. Yusuke doesn't get why the enemy would bother wasting their time on Kuwabara since his power is gone, but Genkai tells him that Kuwabara's powers weren't gone, they've just been dormant while undergoing a transformation. Genkai thinks that due to Kuwabara's exceptional spirit awareness, his body sensed the coming danger months in advance and began the transformation even without his knowledge. It's her fear that if the enemy has realized what was going on with Kuwabara, then he wouldn't be their last target, he'd be their first. As you saw with his conflict with Matari, Genkai was right on the money. Now, this all cycles back to that exchange Yusuke and Kuwabara had before Matari hit the scene. After Genkai's warning, Yusuke takes off to look for Kuwabara, not just because he doesn't want Kuwabara's new power to fall into the enemy hands, but because he's genuinely concerned about the safety of his friend, immediately going back on his statement. Just don't expect me to save your ass when it's demon season. On Kuwabara's end, regardless of the absence of his powers, he stood against Matari and put his own life at risk to save people he cared for. Not only did he reawaken his powers, 
but he managed to turn the tables in a hopeless situation and save himself. And he did it without Yusuke, making good on his words to the spirit detective. Like I need help from you! Not only does he get to make good on his words, he also gets to speak his truth directly to Yusuke at the conclusion of the encounter. I saved them all, all by myself, Yurumeshi. It's a moment of validation that Kobara deserved, and I think the legitimacy this afforded Kobara in the eyes of Yusuke ties directly into a decision the spirit detective makes near the end of the arc. I'm sure by this point in the video, those of you who have never seen this story arc are wondering why it's called Chapter Black. It's an abstract name that when compared to the arcs before it, doesn't exactly lend itself to reading between the lines or context clues to figure it out. Only with context does it even make a lick of sense, and following Kuwabara's last minute triumph over Matari, the information finally makes its way into the hands of the audience. Chapter Black is the name of a top secret videotape that's typically buried deep in Spirit World's archives. It's a compilation of the most vile, heinous, and horrific atrocities carried out by the human race, documenting the very worst of human history. Despite it being contained on a seemingly normal video cassette, it is said to run thousands of hours in length. Given just how long human civilization has been around, I can only assume there's more than enough to choose from in terms of material. It becomes clear that on top of the bullying Matari endured in his life and the subsequent manipulation of those latent negative emotions by Sensui, the Chapter Black film played a massive role in reshaping his perception of humans as well as their capacity for evil. The biggest divide between Team Urameshi and Sensui 7 comes into view once again when Yusuke asks Matari if he thinks he's better than everyone he saw on the Chapter Black tape. Matari says he knows that he's not, following up by saying, No human can be! The clear and obvious counter-argument is Kuwabara's decision to save Matari, which goes to show just how different Yusuke and Sensui's teams look at the world and the people in it. Finally, Kurama fills Yusuke in on what he'd been doing in Spirit World along with his suspicions surrounding the likelihood of Koenma knowing exactly who their enemy was. Once Koenma is brought into the conversation through some, uh... EARTH THE TODDLER BITCH! Polite persuasion, Team Yurameshi is told flat out the enemy's name, Shinobu Sensui. But the real bombshell is dropped when Koenma reveals that Sensui was the spirit detective of Earth before Yusuke. <laughs> Leading up to his final days as a spirit detective, Sensui would repeatedly ask Koenma if humans were even worth protecting. Pretty big red flag when protecting humans is literally your entire job. Soon after these inquiries, both he and the chapter Black film disappeared. Koenma departs Spirit World to talk to Team Yurameshi in person, and this is when we get the full rundown of the man that's pulling the strings of the story arc. When recounting his story, Koenma says that in his entire reign, nothing felt more natural than choosing Sensui as spirit detective. Sensui was a prodigy like Kuwabara in terms of spirit awareness, and could sense apparitions, which in turn drew spirits to him like magnets. Unlike Kuwabara, however, Sensui could also destroy them. Since we had a very black and white perspective of the world, demons were evil and needed to be destroyed, while humans were good and needed to be protected. What ultimately set everything in motion was having his black and white worldview utterly destroyed by the pervasive ambiguity of grey morality. By some bizarre coincidence, the same case Sensui was working on at that time was to close a 10 meter wide portal connecting the human world and demon world. It was the exact same set of circumstances that Yusuke and his friends were facing, but on a smaller scale than the current tunnel. The former portal was a trap by the fledgling Black Black Club. It was designed to capture demons that passed through to sell them at enormous profit. If the Black Black Club sounds familiar, it's because they were the ones pulling the strings behind the Dark Tournament before Toguro and Sakio made them all take a dirt nap. Speaking of Sakio, he was very much a pioneer of the demon trafficking industry, which was how he eventually ended up working his way into the Shadow Organization. Koenma caught wind of a gathering that was supposed to have every member of the Black Black Club present along with important figures in the demon trading business. He figured if Sensui could successfully intervene, they could bring the demon trade business crumbling down. Sensui's partner during the operation was Itsuki, who you'll recognize as being among Sensui's seven psychics, aiding his current crusade. At some point in their past, after nearly being killed by Sensui, Itsuki ended up serving in a similar role to how Kurama aids Yusuke. After infiltrating the place of interest, Sensui stumbles upon the Feast of Human Vices, a ritualistic party where corrupt businessmen and women tortured and otherwise mutilated the demons they'd captured for little more than their own entertainment and pleasure. Sensui had dedicated his life to protecting humans, but at the feast, he witnessed humans committing unspeakable acts of cruelty against defenseless demons on a scale that he hadn't ever seen demons commit against humans. Unable to reconcile his worldview and belief system with what he'd borne witness to, Sensui snapped and murdered every human in attendance. 
When Itsuki stumbles upon the scene, Sensui says, There weren't any humans when I came through the door. Not a single soul. A lot of viewers would hear this line and interpret it as Sensui attempting to lie to Itsuki to cover up his role in the massacre. However, if we step back and remember how Sensui saw the world, it makes more sense. To him, there wasn't an ounce of humanity to be found in any of the people taking part in the feast. Without that, they were just monsters to be put down the same way he'd put down countless demons. The line dividing humans from demons had been blurred so drastically that it forced him to question everything he stood for, and ultimately led him to question if humans were even worth protecting in the first place. This fateful night is the linchpin that drove Sensui to steal the chapter black tape. The tape, mind you, that is chock full of things humans have done that were even worse than what he just personally witnessed, and then he vanished with the tape for 10 years. While a great deal of what was to come can be laid at Sensui's feet, it's clear that Koenma blames himself for Sensui's descent into madness. He should have been able to predict how someone with as rigid a sense of black and white as Sensui's would react to being waterboarded with an ocean of grey. Before long, Yusuke and Kurama both sense that they're being watched, discovering Sensui and Sniper on a rooftop opposite them. Kuobar is the first to realize that the enemy is there to kill Matari now that his usefulness has run out. Turns out there's a tracking bug in Matari's pocket planted by Sensui who is counting on Matari's overall weakness to lead him to Yusuke's group. He never truly believed Matari would be a genuinely useful partner, instead realizing quite early that he'd be the weakest link and chose to exploit the same insecurity he had earlier preyed upon to coax Matari into his service. Yet again, we're shown that Sensui always has a seemingly unshakable plan and that his subordinates are just tools to get him closer to his goal. The confrontation moves to the street and Sensui comes bearing even more bad news for Team Yurameshi. The timetable on the portal has moved up yet again from one week to only two days. As the viewers, it's easy to empathize with the frustration of Team Yurameshi constantly being told they have less and less time to find a solution to their problem. Think of all the times at work or in your spare time when you had a tough task to do and every time you got into a rhythm to work out a solution, someone moved up your deadline considerably. It's disorienting to have the rug pulled out from under you right when you get your footing and often leads to mistakes because you're suddenly rushing to meet your goal before time runs out. This is the position Team Yurameshi keeps finding themselves in. If I was given a project and was told I had three weeks to do it, only to be told a couple of days later that it was due in two days, I'd probably have a meltdown. And that's before you factor in whether getting my project done determined if the world was going to end or not. Yusuke goes to throw hands with Sensui and Koenma warns him to be careful. Sensui has had the same training as Yusuke as well as 10 additional years of overall experience. So I missed. Yusuke gets manhandled, establishing the gap in their power and combat prowess. The gap in technique is also slammed onto the table when Sensui flexes his signature with the Reiku Rishuyuken an orb of spirit energy he kicks using his preferred martial art. He sends the orb crashing into Yusuke's apartment, which has two purposes. One, that it's likely to kill Matari, and two, to send a signal to Game Master and Gourmet, who spring into action. Sensui dips out with Yusuke, Kuwabara, and Kurama in hot pursuit. Why are you running? Why are you running? It leads to another scrap between the detectives, and while Yusuke does appear to be adapting to Sensui's style, it still isn't enough to avoid getting laid out. Our favorite Ginger Pompadour attempts to summon his new sword but can't seem to get it up. Sensui hypothesizes that Kuobara must require external stimulus in order to conjure it. He then flexes on our boys even harder by demonstrating that not only is he skilled enough to easily deal with Yusuke, he's capable of parrying Kuobara's spirit sword with his bare hand. Being the smart boy he is, Kurama knows that his Rosewood can hit multiple points simultaneously, making it far harder for Sensui to deal with, but Sensui is also aware of that trait and purposely moves the skirmish outdoors and into an open space filled with civilians. His many years of experience afford him the intuition to know that Kurama wouldn't want to run the risk of his whip accidentally hitting a bystander. This ability to make split-second decisions in battle to tilt the scales in his favor is one of the many traits that makes Sensui such a dangerous foe when pitted against our heroes. Before they know what's really hit them, they've fallen into Sensui's trap and allowed themselves to be separated from one another. Yusuke is so fixated on chasing Sensui that he doesn't realize that the wheels were in motion to apprehend Kobara, which Game Master and Gourmet successfully do. Game Master drives the getaway truck while Gourmet restrains Kobara using a power that's eerily similar to everyone's least favorite Tagoro brother. A little earlier, Gourmet had consumed what was left of Tagoro and assimilated his power into himself. There's a huge asterisk on that statement that we'll cycle back to later on. All you need to know for now is that Gourmet has got wiggly tendies. As you can likely guess from this reveal though, Sensui intends to have Gourmet consume Kuobara in order to acquire the power of the Jiginto and cut open the Kakai barrier. Once Yusuke finally realizes what's happening, we get another show of just how close he and Kuobara have become when Yusuke says, 
Keiko, you know I can't let them hurt Kuwabara. Now don't tell me not to save him. It's what he would do. These moments where Yusuke is being honest with himself in regard to how much he cares about his best friend and how he recognizes the humanity in Kuwabara are pretty much at the heart of the shared character arc of the two during this saga. But we're not given long to ponder on this because shortly after, Yusuke, like an Olympic champion, gives chase on a goddamn bicycle. Not only does Yusuke manage to keep the truck in his line of sight, he catches up to the damn thing. But Sniper shows up and prevents Yusuke from reaching Kuwabara, which leads the two into a battle of their own. While that's going down, Matari is having a real crisis of perspective since those in Yusuke's entourage don't behave the way Sensui convinced him that all people do. The kindness they afford him flies in the face of everything Sensui stands for and he can't quite square that circle. First Kuwabara saves his life right after Matari tried to murder his friends, and then Botan gets herself injured by shoving Matari out of the way of a falling bookshelf when Sensui's Rishuyuken blasts the apartment. Matari bases his lack of understanding for their kindness on what he'd seen on the chapter black tape, but Koenma makes it clear that the tape was part of a set and wasn't meant to be viewed in isolation. This leaves us room to speculate that an exact opposite tape must exist as a counterpart showing the very best of humanity. Matari goes on to explain to Genkai and the others why Kuwabara was Sensui's target, but he actually says something that's far more important on a personal level. Kuwabara's a lot stronger, a lot more important than any of you seem to give him credit for. It's a point that reminds the audience that it isn't just Yusuke that undervalues Kuwabara, it's the entirety of Team Urameshi. While they recognize his achievements to some degree, they don't necessarily acknowledge him as being on par with them as warriors. In their own ways, they all kind of clown on Kuwabara, Genkai and Kurama included. So it was only natural that they wouldn't even begin to suspect that he would be such an important piece in Sensui's puzzle. Genkai's response really conveys the gravity of the threat they face when she says, I trust Yusuke with a lot these days, but not this. Meaning that even though he's the dark tournament champion and literally stronger than everyone in that room combined, they could not afford to do nothing and simply hope Yusuke would come out on top. It has very much become an all hands on deck doomsday scenario in light of all the new information. Koenma understands there's a very real possibility that they could fail to stop Sensui and heads off to Spirit World to make preparations for such an event. Back with Yusuke, I'm actually going to skip to the end of this fight with Sniper because it's mostly a lot of and then Yusuke runs. And thematically, Sniper is the least interesting member of Sensui 7. At the end of this battle, he intervenes on Yusuke's behalf and neutralizes Sniper pretty easily. It's interesting to note that when he makes his appearance, Sniper says, I have no quarrel with you, stranger. What makes this so striking is that when measured against what he's done for Sensui, it undermines his words. Sniper is willing to let Hiei go on about his business because he has no quarrel with him, but he attacked a man mostly unrelated to Team Urameshi just to make a point, and more obviously, is helping enact Sensui's plan of unleashing countless demons on billions of innocent people that he also has no true quarrel with. The compartmentalization and mental gymnastics it takes to have the audacity to say such a thing just reinforces how much Sensui has warped those he's enlisted. Yusuke is understandably upset at just how powerless he feels even after overcoming the obstacle that was Togoro. He assumed Tokoro was as strong as demons could get, so being knocked down a few pegs by not only the realization that he was nowhere near the top, but that Sensui, a human, had demonstrated himself to be above his post-tournament power level is a lot for him to process. Yusuke and Hiei end up throwing hands with each other for the first time since they met, which I gotta admit is fun to see happen again. Hiei wanted to make a point to Yusuke that there's a distinct difference between Tagoro and Sensui in relation to the spirit detective. Tagoro knew that Yusuke had untapped potential and went out of his way to draw that power out of Yusuke, whereas Sensui simply wants Yusuke dead. If Yusuke was to have any hope of overcoming the rogue spirit detective, he'd need to learn to rely on harnessing his own energy instead of waiting for someone else to trigger it in him. It's a fair point to make because in terms of Yusuke's biggest cases, he's required outside intervention in order to take things to the next level. With Rando, it was hearing the words of a broken and battered Kuwabara. With Suzaku, it was knowing that if he didn't turn the tides, Keiko would end up being killed. And with Tagoro, it was the perceived loss of Kuwabara that finally broke down the wall separating him from his well of power. But in this circumstance, there wasn't anything to push him over the line. He was in peak condition, at the top of his game, and despite that, he must have felt like there was suddenly a ceiling right above him. Hiei's harsh lesson made him realize that he needed to be able to rely on himself to push past his limits when the chips were down. Following this conversation, Yusuke takes a moment to set aside his pride and legitimately ask Hiei for his help. Look, what I'm trying to say is that I could really use your help on this one. Kuwabara could really use your help on this one. 
Both statements reinforce the fact that Yusuke is finally coming to realize that he can't do this on his own. The real fight hasn't even started yet and he's already struggling to keep up. For a character like Yusuke, it's a pretty mature and sobering moment. At first, the lack of a challenge in the wake of the tournament was boring the life out of him, but now that he's in the thick of it and on the precipice of total disaster, he's not as confident as he was when the arc began. After securing Hiei's help, they're set upon by a pair of low-level demons signaling that Mushiori City has advanced to stage 3. The dispatch of these demons is quick, and with little time to waste, the pair set off to reconvene with Karama's group, who have all begun making their way towards Demon Store Cave. I can't speak for anyone else, but the Goblin City portion of Chapter Black is unironically my favorite segment. It's not as flashy or action-heavy as Team Yermesh's clashes with everyone in Sensory 7 thus far, but in terms of what it has to say about the dangerous naivety of misguided children and the obedience that they afford adults simply because of the authority that comes with age, it's pretty intense. Kids are often annoying as hell, but that's often because they're still learning about the world around them as well as their place in it. As adults, it's easy to forget that children are an amalgamation of the choices made by other adults. They're susceptible to suggestion, their perspective is very narrow compared to their world experience, and that lack of understanding is easy to capitalize on when kids perceive the status quo as unfair or oppressive. When you take that juvenile outlook, place it in the hands of someone with ill intent who knows what they're doing down to the last detail, and then throw it at a bunch of empathetic teenagers who have no choice but to look at that child as an obstacle, you end up with the tragedy that is Goblin City. After taking the time to recount what they know about their situation, Genkai suggests a small group go into the cave first to act as a scouting party. This party ends up being Yusuke, Karamahie, and Matari. Matari mentions that if they move quickly but cautiously, it should take them about two hours to reach the chamber where Kuwabara is being kept. With Matari showing them the way, they eventually stumble upon a mysterious door preventing further progression. A door, Matari says, isn't supposed to be there. While standing there, the intro to the video game Goblin City plays, the same video game that Yusuke was seen playing at the arcade when Kuwabara was up against Matari. It was a subtle hint back then at what they'd be up against, and I do appreciate that detail coming back around for those who were paying attention. The manifestation of Goblin City is a product of Amanuma's territory, hence the codename Game Master. He says to them through the door, The rules of the game are the rules of my territory, and the rules of my territory are the rules of the game. These two lines are absolutely critical later, so keep them in the back of your head. Unfortunately, because his territory operates via the rules of the Goblin City game, Yusuke and the other three can't even enter until they have seven players with them. Kurama hypothesizes that the enemy group knew Team Urameshi would be cautious and send a small scouting party, and decided to use Goblin City to force the entire group to enter the cave together. Without a way to subvert that rule, they're forced to turn back and retrieve the others, which wastes vital time. With Genkai, Yana, and Kaito among them, they begin their clash with the grade school student. Unlike the other psychics they faced, Amanuma challenges them to a selection of minigames straight out of the Goblin City activity list. Each of them can play only once, and they only need to win 4 out of the 7 games in order to prevail over Amanuma. Matari is the first to play against one of Amanuma's bots and emerges victorious which leads to a wonderful moment that's indicative of his growth when instead of gloating, he turns to the child and says, Amanuma, Mr. Sensui was right about one thing he said. I was weak in that I lacked the courage to accept responsibility for my unhappiness. It was because of that weakness that I bought into Sensui's mission. Blaming the world is the coward's way out, but I'm no weak link. I think this encapsulates not only the underlying tragedy of Sensui as well as those he manipulated into following him, but even plenty of people in the real world that are more willing to offload the blame onto others in a bid to dodge responsibility, rather than take a good hard look in the mirror and recognize that they themselves contribute to and enable their own unhappiness. After this, Genkai and Yusuke both win their games with relative ease, with Genkai playing through an action-based flight simulator and Yusuke barreling through a beat-em-up. Despite their victories and being on the cusp of defeating him, Amanuma eagerly steps in to play and Team Urameshi is a bit put off by how cheerful the kid appears to be. Karama cautions Yusuke to consider looking for an alternate way out of the territory in case things took a turn for the worst. Yusuke's anxiety is further increased by Karama's warning. He's seen Karama stand up against the worst odds without flinching, so to know the Spirit Fox is so concerned makes him question just how bad of a situation they must be in. When the next game is decided, it ends up being a trivia game that's well suited to someone like Kaito, and Amanuma shows a bit of annoyance, saying it's his least favorite and that he wanted to beat Team Urameshi in style. However, Karama notices that regardless of the candid admission, Amanuma still appears to be at ease. Matari notes that he's never seen Amanuma practice using his territory because since we didn't want him to. This is an incredibly important statement and we'll get back to it in just a few moments, I promise. 
Amanuma stands back and allows Kaito to get the first five questions, still completely unfazed. Kaito demonstrates that he only needs to know how a question begins to choose the correct answer, essentially having memorized all 17,000 questions in the game's database. Still, even in the face of this incredible play, Amanuma remains unbothered. He simply watches the questions intensely, focusing on something unknown to Team Urameshi. Out of nowhere, Amanuma declares he's ready to play and prematurely announces his come from behind victory. When the next question begins, before a single word is uttered, Amanuma selects his answer and ends up being correct. As it turns out, he was trying to determine which order the game's algorithm was using to choose the questions and needed to see the first five in order to figure out which track it was on, hence giving Kaito the five question handicap. Naturally, after this shift in momentum, Amanuma completely obliterates Kaito. Surprisingly, Amanuma is a good sport about winning and offers to play more games with Kaito later, leading Team Yurameshi to believe the child doesn't truly understand what it is he's involved in. Kurama suspects that even if they lost all the games, no harm would be done to them as long as they continued playing, since a player is only technically treated as dead in Goblin City if they choose to quit instead of putting in more quarters to facilitate more attempts. As you'll remember, the rules of the territory are the rules of the game and vice versa. Picking up on the ridiculous loop that would lock them in, Yusuke mentions that they don't have time for that kind of stun lock, to which Kurama relays that wasting what precious time they have until the portal to Demon World is open was exactly Sensui's point for forcing them to clash with Amanuma. The longer they spend trying to get out of Goblin City, the less time they'll have to interfere with Sensui's plan. After Team Yurimeshi figures out Sensui's plan to stall them using Goblin City, Amanuma states that once the tunnel is complete, he'll simply forfeit and just let them all go. Kurama shows a clear reluctance at the idea of defeating Amanuma, reiterating to Yusuke and the audience that Amanuma is, in fact, bound by the same rules as they are and should he lose, Amanuma would have to share the same fate as the Goblin King at the game's conclusion. This realization shows us again just how conniving and un caring Sensui is in regard to his recruits, but also just how painfully naive Amanuma is when it comes to the direct consequences of his own territory. Kurama curses Sensui for continuously putting them in such morally gray situations, realizing that if Team Yurameshi wanted to rescue Kuwabara and stop Sensui, Amanuma had to be defeated, but doing so would undoubtedly condemn the child to death. It becomes a tense moral dilemma since the team needs to stop Sensui above all else, but Amanuma hasn't necessarily done anything wrong in the time we've known him. Up to this point in the story, his only real crimes are driving without a license, the kidnapping of Kuwabara, and being blind to his status as a pawn in Sensui's game. I don't know about you, but those aren't exactly crimes worthy of the death penalty, and clearly Kurama thinks so too. Shouldering the burden of this crisis of morality on his own, Kurama steps up to defeat Amanuma. Before the game begins, Kurama asks the boy if Sensui himself suggested he use Goblin City as his tool for impeding Team Urameshi, to which Amanuma confirms Kurama's fear. Again, Amanuma demonstrates that he doesn't quite understand the ramifications of Sensui's plan when Kurama presses him on it. He mentions they're not being school and saying he just thought it would be funny. In both an effort to make Amanuma soberingly aware of just how dire his situation was and as a way to shake his concentration during the competition, Kurama shatters Amanuma's naive illusion and informs the child that he'll die if he loses to Team Urameshi. It's also here that we get confirmation from Amanuma himself that since we prohibited him from using his power to manifest high stakes games like Goblin City before the opportune time. Hell, Sensui himself was the one that provided the Goblin City cartridge Amanuma was using as the foundation of his current manifestation. The more Kurama thinks about the viciousness of the situation Sensui had trapped them and an ignorant child in, the more frustrated he becomes. Kurama, of every character in Team Yurameshi's roster, is known for keeping his cool even in grim scenarios. However, this instance shakes that call demeanor for the audience to see through subtle body language, inflections, and tone. Since we purposely neglected to tell Amanuma about the inherent dangers of his territory because he didn't want that knowledge to prevent him from doing what was asked of him. As Genkai put it, young people think they're invincible, too young to die so they aren't consumed by the fear of it. However, since we was counting on Team Urameshi to figure it out so that they'd be consumed by the thought of their actions killing an otherwise innocent kid. It's psychological warfare designed to test their moral limits and see if they could find a way within themselves to justify that kill. Yusuke expresses reluctance to the idea of justifying the killing of Amanuma the same way he showed apprehension about killing Dr. Kamiya. Yusuke is still a bit of a punk, but he's got very strong moral convictions indicative of what he's decided it means to be both a hero and a spirit detective. However, Kurama has already justified the kill, which was why he told Amanuma what Sensui wouldn't. 
It essentially boiled down to a question of, is sticking to your morality to save the life of one worth the lives of billions? Either way, someone is going to die, and a choice had to be made, so Karama made that choice. Amanuma, saddled with the knowledge that since we didn't give a damn whether he lived or died, begins to make mistakes in the game he and Karama are engaged in. The prospect of dying has completely derailed his focus, giving Karama the upper hand. What makes it worse is that Amanuma's life wasn't even all that bad. He was just a bored kid who enjoyed video games more than sports, so he didn't exactly have anyone with similar interests to befriend. He describes his parents as either fighting or working, so there's an air of neglect but more so the vibe that he just wanted to be seen and acknowledged by others on a personal level. Compared to Mantari, Amanuma's life was pretty easygoing, yet that childish desire to rebel against things just because they weren't as he wanted them to be landed him in the palm of Sensui's hand. It isn't long before the fear that set in has Amanuma asking Karama if there's anything he could do to avoid his fate. To his credit, Karama does ask if there was a way to avoid his own power, still hoping that there was a way out without having to end the boy's life. As was the case when Yusuke fought Kamiya, Karama truly didn't want to kill his opponent. Unfortunately, Amanuma relays that there's no way to shut a game down while it's still in progress. Karama refuses to entertain the idea of purposely throwing the game, adding more fuel to Amanuma's downward spiral. There's an excruciating bleakness to hearing a child shout that they don't want to die as they're watching their time run out. Their victory over Game Master, while necessary, draws no celebration or cheers as the grim reality of what Karama had just done is emphasized by a close-up of his face being swallowed by darkness, punctuated by the sound of a heartbeat that eventually stops. With the heartbeat doubling as the intense turmoil Karama must be feeling emotionally, as well as Amanuma's life coming to an abrupt end. The silence is broken by the disturbingly cheery sound of the game's narrator juxtaposed against the fresh corpse of Amanuma lying motionless on the tiled floor. Hark and rejoice, for the evil goblin king is dead! Fresh off the heels of that brand new trauma, Team Urameshi finally arrives at Sensui's hideout where they're casually told that they only have a half an hour left before the portal opens. Outside, Koenma returns from his trip to Spirit World, where he went to get permission from his father to remove his trademark pacifier in case of an emergency. From Botan's reaction, it's easy to assume that that's not exactly a good sign. Before he proceeds into the cave to rendezvous with Team Urameshi, he gives Botan contingency instructions in the event of a worst case scenario. Deep in the cave, with the same smug attitude he's donned the entire saga, Sensui calls out Yusuke and Kurama. Yusuke for nearly killing Dr. Kamiya and Kurama for killing Amanuma. However, Yusuke rationalizes that they did those things for the greater good. Since we asked, so what if every human was bad, but Yusuke quickly quashes that line of questioning by saying he doesn't deal in what ifs, once again showing just how differently the two generations of spirit detectives view the world as well as the people in it. Those clashing perspectives act as a line in the sand, with Sensui coming away from his experiences jaded and believing that if any humans were capable of the horrors he personally witnessed at the Feast of Human Vices as well as the atrocities contained on the countless hours of the Chapter Black Tape, then by proxy all humans are capable of that same evil. In contrast, Yusuke came away from his experiences with a far more hopeful outlook, seeing the kindness and compassion afforded to him not only by fellow humans, but by apparitions of demons too. The two biggest examples of this being Kurama and Hiei themselves. Don't forget, they both began as his enemies. Since we summons Gourmet to his side and propositions Team Urameshi, if they can kill Gourmet, yet another human, right then and there, he would release Kuwabara. If they refused, he'd deflect any other attack they make by using Kuwabara as a human shield. Even now, Sensui was prodding at their moral boundaries by stacking more stress onto their shoulders, effectively calling Yusuke out on his greater good rhetoric. At the same time, it's a very clever power play on Sensui's part. Instead of trying to predict what Yusuke and his friends will do, he's controlling the flow of the situation by making the choice for them. Tensions begin to run even higher as Gourmet belittles Matari and Kurama with information he shouldn't have. With Matari, he comments that the young man was trying so hard to save Kulbara as repayment for being saved by him. In that same vein, he vocalizes that Matari is also terrified of Sensui finding out just how important Kuwabara has become to him, fearful of the idea that Sensui would kill Kuwabara to punish Matari for his betrayal. With Kurama, he relays that the fox is far more guilt-ridden about killing Amanuma than he's been letting on. On top of that, he's embarrassed because Yoko Kurama, his true form, would never be so weak as to become torn up over a casualty like Amanuma. Yusuke and the audience are led to pick up on what's really happening at about the same rate. Turns out, Gourmet had found and consumed Maroda, the psychic from earlier in the arc that was able to read minds. It explains why despite being in relatively good shape at the conclusion of the fiasco at the hospital, Maroda has been completely absent from the story. Karama steps forward to confront the psychic and in a flash, he uses his rose whip to tear the man's skull in half, leaving only the bottom jaw. 
Being the calm, analytical person he is, Karama was able to overcome Gourmet's stolen mind reading by completely and flawlessly clearing his mind to rely only on impulse. The brutality of the attack surprises everyone, including Sensui. The trial isn't over yet though, as Karama sniffs out the stench of the Elder Tagoro, who is still lingering inside Gourmet's body. As we learn, Sensui and Tagoro agreed that his regeneration was taking too long and he needed a new body. So Sensui instructed the blissfully unaware Gourmet to consume him, allowing the man to believe that Tagoro was the one being betrayed when the exact opposite was true. After this consumption, Tagoro ended up taking control of Gourmet's body little by little. What makes this so damn messed up is that Gourmet became aware of what was happening to him pretty quickly and by Tagoro's own testimony, he could feel just how afraid Gourmet was. Imagine completely losing control of your body to an entirely different consciousness, not even all at once, but little by little. Having the agency ripped out of your hands without any means of defending yourself must be a crippling reality to deal with. To make matters worse is that we're never told if Gourmet was truly gone or if he simply ended up a passenger in his own body, unable to act of his own volition while watching another, far more evil man walk around with his face and voice. Anyway, after this bit of information, we find out that Tagoro was the one that informed Sensui about the many achievements of Yusuke, the new spirit detective, which Sensui interpreted as the wheels of fate turning. The revelation that a new spirit detective existed and one as decorated as Yusuke to boot was what pushed Sensui to finally enact his plan and end up on a collision course with him. As Sensui put it, In the trial against humanity, the defense now had an able attorney. It cements the idea that through Yusuke, Sensui would be judging whether or not humanity deserved to live. Once again, Kurama steps up to the plate and confronts Tagoro. In a display of both his tactical prowess and of cruelty uncharacteristic of the Kurama we've come to know, but not necessarily uncharacteristic of Yoko, Kurama uses a pretty horrifying plant known as the Sinning Tree to trap the surviving Tagoro brother in an endless illusion where the tree feeds on his life. However, Tagoro's regenerative powers are so strong that he's basically been sentenced to an eternity of suffering inside the tree's hallucination. It's kind of freaking brutal, but it allows us to see what Kurama's like when he quietly loses his cool and allows his anger to take hold. Also, if Gourmet's consciousness is still stuck in that body with Tagoro, then he's also been condemned to eternal suffering without any ability to free himself from it. So that's nice. Uh, Karam, if I ever did something that pissed you off, I'm sorry. At the behest of Sensui, Itsuki summons a creature that swallows Team Yurameshi whole, Cool Ball included, trapping them all in a different dimension, kind of like a territory. However, the creature spits Yusuke back out to face Sensui by himself, isolating him from his allies. Itsuki also backs off, retreating inside the creature to join Team Yurameshi so that the two detectives can face one another without interference from either side. Kuwabara and the others can see and hear everything happening, but they can do nothing to intervene. Itsuki raises an interesting argument about how Sensui's actions are themselves proof of his purity. As he describes it, were you to drop ink on snow white paper, it would inevitably absorb that ink as demanded by the paper's purity. Black doesn't absorb more blackness, so in a way, tainted men have a kind of immunity from that. For Sensui to be so warped and changed by his horrific experiences demonstrates that prior to such events, he was pure and his soul simply did what a snow white piece of paper would do and absorbed the many ink spots dropped onto it. Were Yusuke and company to prevent Sensui's plans from coming to fruition, it would demonstrate the opposite point, that Sensui's purity was never real to begin with. It's an argument that shifts the responsibility of the world ending to the feet of the men and women that tainted Sensui. Itsuki tries to argue that he's not making excuses for Sensui's depravity, but he most certainly is. He's got his blinders on because of the deep sense of admiration and the not so platonic love he has for Sensui. Unfortunately for Kuwabara and crew, they can't simply kill Itsuki then and there. If they do, the creature they're being held captive inside of will trap them there forever, as Itsuki is the only one that has any control over it. Since we tell Yusuke that if he continues down the road of being a spear detective, it's only a matter of time before he ends up just like Sensui. He tells Yusuke that the horrors he'll see will only weigh down his soul as experiences accumulate without healing, and eventually the evil Yusuke's chasing will become who he is. It's a very similar argument to Harvey Dent's iconic die a hero or become a villain sentiment in The Dark Knight. To legitimize his point, Sensui asks Yusuke to consider where he was in life just a year ago before he became a spear detective, and questions if the boy would have ever imagined killing another human being before emphasizing that now Team Yurameshi has killed three in under a week. In Sensui's mind, ten more years on a decline that steep would be more than enough for Yusuke to end up in his shoes. Yusuke doesn't take kindly to this hypothetical and lands his first real strike on Sensui. He relays that plenty of things in his life have pissed him off, but none of it has been because of his work as a spirit detective, as it's the one thing he's actually good at. Then he goes on to say, And if all the crap in my life hasn't screwed me up yet, then neither will this. And neither will you. 
Since we can posture and hypothesize all he wants about human nature, but Yusuke is steadfast in who he is as a person and understands things about life that Sensui just doesn't. Yusuke doesn't think too much, he's impulsive and belligerent at times, but on a fundamental level he understands that a great deal of situations in life aren't cut and dry. His lived experiences as a spirit detective and his growth from them set him down an entirely different course from Sensui, but all Sensui can see is his own trauma. As things really kick off, the situation only gets rougher for Yusuke as Sensui unveils yet another technique, the Splinter Rishuyuken, which inundates our hero with a myriad of miniature but powerful orbs of spirit energy that home in on their target. The unveiling of this attack draws attention to a very real weakness of Yusuke's. He's gotten so used to one-on-one -on -one fights that he's become spoiled in a sense. His track record of duels have caused Yusuke to think in very linear fashion in terms of both attack and defense. Having rarely had to deal with multiple dangerous foes at once attacking from various angles, Yusuke hasn't had any real reason to work on his defensive skills. The Splinter Rishuyuken is a damn near perfect technique for exploiting that weakness. In a flash of creativity, Yusuke tears off his shirt and uses it to bind his wrist to Sensui's, limiting Sensui's tactical options in such close quarters. For a moment, Yusuke does get the upper hand, but then something strange happens. Sensui's free hand turns into a literal gun barrel and he shoots Yusuke through his side, which is enough to separate the two. When Sensui gets back up, his mannerisms, speech patterns, and even his voice are different. It's as though an entirely different person was suddenly inhabiting his body. This person is far more vulgar and much less sophisticated than Sensui, going by the name Kazuya. This is when we find out from Itsuki that Sensui has multiple personalities with seven total coexisting within his mind. To grossly oversimplify for the sake of time, Sensui suffers from what is known as Dissociative Identity Disorder, a mental disorder that is characterized by the maintenance of at least two distinct and enduring personality states or identities. The distinct identities are accompanied by changes in behavior, memory, and thinking. The condition is associated with overwhelming traumas or abuse during childhood. While a great many instances of this disorder can be linked to a history of childhood abuse, other cases are linked to separate traumas like experiences during war. That is an incredible oversimplification of a very complicated mental disorder, so if you'd like to learn more, I suggest doing some additional research on your own time. As I'm sure you've guessed by now, Sensui's trauma extends almost exclusively from what he witnessed during the Feast of Human Vices, but that's not the only thing that sent him spiraling. Alongside those horrors came the realization that his murders of demon kind as the protector of human world can no longer be justified. The guilt stemming from that gave rise to Kazuya, who would assume responsibility for his atrocious actions. In order to recruit people to his side, since we knew he'd need to lie and deceive to accomplish that task, and so charismatic personality Minoru was born. Minoru is likely the one that we see in flashbacks convincing Matari and Amanuma to his side, and after seeing the way Dr. Kamiya parroted certain talking points, it's not outrageous to assume Minoru was the one responsible. Considering what happens in a little bit, it's also not far-fetched to assume that Minoru is the one the audience has been accustomed to seeing at the helm over the course of the arc, because if you recall, Sensui never properly introduced himself to Yusuke. Without the additional context of the disorder he suffers from, Yusuke would have no reason to assume it was anyone but Sensui talking to him. What we come to learn is that, as Sensui's plan grew in scope and complexity, every time he faced a moral crisis of any sort, a new personality was born to overcome that hurdle. This allowed the core personality to do what he needed to do while distancing himself from taking responsibility for the morally and ethically bankrupt behavior. With this mental defense in place, Sensui could carry out the same sins he was intending to punish humans for without defiling the theoretical purity we spoke of earlier. That separation from the acts his additional personalities carried out gave him the buffer to both blame them and grieve for what they've done. Anyway, Kazuya absolutely brutalizes Yusuke, much to the dismay of his allies, but Kuwabara in particular. Kuwabara wants desperately to break free from the creature that holds them in order to help Yusuke, but he just can't seem to get his Dimension Sword to manifest. Right before Kazuya gets a chance to make Yusuke take a dirt nap, Koenma finally shows up. First things first though, let's give Koenma a round of applause for his stamina. It took Yusuke and crew two hours to walk to Sensui's lair from the entrance, not counting their time in Goblin City, and Koenma sprinted all the way there! Koenma intervenes to offer Sensui one last chance to abandon his plan or he'll be forced to act. As it turns out, Koenma had no idea about Sensui's fractured mind. It doesn't take long for negotiations to break down with Kazuya, and when they do, Koenma removes his pacifier for the first time in the series. His pacifier is the casting medium for the Mafuken, or the Wicked Seal. When it's fully powered, it is the strongest defensive spell in all of Spirit World. Koenma has kept it in his mouth all throughout the series and for countless eons before because he was using his own spirit energy to charge it in case of emergency. When activated, the Mafuken creates a localized Kakai barrier that is far more powerful than the one between worlds, capable of confining even S-class demons. So needless to say, the spell ain't no joke at maximum strength. 
Cohen must still hold so much guilt inside of himself over Sensui's descent into darkness, feeling as though he should have known how Sensui would react to seeing some of mankind's darkest urges. His guilt is so deeply rooted that in the event he's forced to restrain Sensui with the Mafuken, he intends to imprison himself and suffer an eternity of torturous motionlessness alongside the former spirit detective, as a way of atoning for his negligence. After spending the entire series using Koenma as both a punchline and an exposition machine, it's captivating to watch his personal arc play out the way it does. At the last second, Yusuke stops him and takes the pacifier, not quite ready to give up just yet. Yusuke demands that Kazuya switch out with whomever the top dog is, saying he has no time to waste on him because he's too easy. Naturally, Kazuya doesn't take kindly to being disrespected, but in a complete reversal from earlier, Yusuke drops him with a flurry of ferocious punches to the gut. Kazuya is forced out of the driver's seat and another personality takes over. What makes the moment so tense is the very uncanny way Sensui's body rises to his feet without a word, as well as the complete absence of any background music. The use of heavy shadows also highlights in a subtle way just how dangerous of a situation Yusuke suddenly put himself in. Finally, Yusuke finds himself face to face with Shinobu, the core personality. He's polite and even cordial, offering Yusuke a handshake the way a normal person would when introducing themselves. Feeling it's likely a fake out, Yusuke instead takes the opportunity to try to get a punch in, but Shinobu easily subverts that and slams him to the ground before stomping on his stomach. While Yusuke is dazed and in pain, Shinobu leans down and completes the handshake he had initially offered the boy. I remember the first time I watched the scene, it made my skin crawl with how sociopathic Shinobu comes across, more concerned with completing the handshake than he was with the harm he caused an actual child. Shinobu begins to radiate something that is neither spirit nor demon energy to the confusion of literally everyone. It's called sacred energy, the highest echelon of power any being can attain that supposedly takes 40 years of training to master. However, 40 years divided among the 7 total personalities all training together in one body drops that benchmark by quite a bit. It's a narrative leap in logic that you just kinda have to take since it sounds cool but doesn't necessarily make sense on paper. Even in the face of this insane energy, Yusuke throws himself at Shinobu but the enemy doesn't need to dodge, block, or parry because Yusuke just doesn't have the strength to breach the sacred energy acting as a barrier. Then we get probably one of the starkest demonstrations of the vast difference in power between the detectives when Shinobu catches one of Yusuke's punches and effortlessly breaks his arms as if he were simply snapping a twig. Seeing just how far apart they truly are, Yusuke resolves to put his last ditch effort into motion, something he's betting the survival of the human race on. Meanwhile, Hiei and Kurama have picked up on just how much danger they're all in, with Shinobu now being on par with an S-class demon. Kurama hypothesizes that Shinobu was still holding back to a degree, and it's clear to Kuwabara and the audience that the demons of Team Urameshi have both gone into their own versions of panic mode. We assumed we'd triumph, that we'd be able to kill another arrogant enemy. We were arrogant this time. At some point during their scuffle, Shinobu snatched Koenma's pacifier from Yusuke, and with things as dire as they were, Koenma uses that opening to activate the spell, unleashing its power on the renegade detective. Even at this juncture, while he has Shinobu damn near dead to rights, Koenma still pleads for him to just surrender. Koenma truly doesn't want to have to condemn Shinobu to eternal confinement and still wants to believe that the former detective can be redeemed. Koenma's guilt comes in two forms and feed into one another. On one hand, as we discussed, he feels responsible for what happened to Shinobu. On the other hand, he's being eaten up by guilt at the idea that Shinobu could very well emerge victorious and doom the human race on his watch, and that he's responsible in his own way for setting the wheels of that potential extinction event in motion. Unfortunately, Shinobu manages to grab hold of the pacifier and forcefully dispel the Mafuken before it can grow strong enough to trap him. Now, that might come across like an arbitrary moment of showing off how strong the antagonist is for shock value, but instead, it shows off just how much thought Shinobu put into the many moving parts and variables of his grand scheme. The only reason Shinobu had even a sliver of a chance of escaping the Mafuken was because Koenma stopped to revive Amanuma on his way down to the lair. Shinobu was planning on Koenma showing up with that spell as a last resort, and he expected the man to be so guilt-ridden over his role in Shinobu's downward spiral that he'd expend energy from the pacifier to bring the dead child back to life. Amanuma was purposely led to avoid using his power in Goblin City so that he'd land squarely in the path of Team Urameshi as a moral dilemma and time waster, but Shinobu was also counting on Team Urameshi to ultimately take the boy's life, which then created an emotional roadblock for Koenma. All of those interwoven gears were placed together specifically to drain just enough power from Koenma's pacifier that the Mafuken could be just weak enough for Shinobu to overcome it in the event Koenma brought out the big guns. When we get this bit of information, it recontextualizes every moment from the arc by forcing the audience to wonder, wait, did Sensui want Team Urameshi to do X, Y, or Z? And the answer a stunning number of times is yes, they were simply given the illusion of choice. 
We're forced to consider all the times our heroes did something of their own free will because they decided it was the right call or strategically correct. Then we're saddled with the realization that at every single step, Sensui was ahead of them, nudging them in the direction he needed them to go and it all still makes sense. This big brain four dimensional chess ties back into what Genkai told Team Yurameshi at the beginning of the arc, how they wouldn't always be able to use their brute strength to solve their problems. Sensui embodies the perfect fusion of strength and intellect that Genkai wanted Team Yurameshi to reach, while also putting on display just how dangerous it was to be up against an enemy that can not only outpunch you, but outthink you. Also, for simplicity's sake, I'm gonna go back to just calling our antagonist Sensui. It was important for me to distinguish Shinobu from the rest during his initial emergence, but since I've been calling him Sensui the entire video, I'm just gonna continue doing so. Anyway, with Konuma's trump card effectively wasted, Yusuke steps up one more time to finally enact the plan he'd been cultivating. Just like Kuwabara had done for Yusuke in the Dark Tournament, Yusuke intends to return the favor in order to help his friends tap into the power they couldn't quite reach, specifically Kuwabara. Only this time, Sensui wouldn't be pulling his punches the way Tagoro did. Kuwabara, through Kurama, realizes that Yusuke is doing what he's doing because his allies aren't living up to their potential. We are the untapped ones. We have the power, but not the strength of mind to reach it, not without the pain of loss. Kuwabara, who throughout the series has been the empathetic one and often took on the role of the audience surrogate in plenty of situations, has a meltdown. For me, this is the moment when we truly see just how important Yusuke is to Kuwabara. Sure, there's the scene from Yusuke's wake in the pilot episode, but at that point, it was more about the context of the scene than the interpersonal relationships of the characters. Kuwabara cares so much for his best friend that he was willing to give up his life to raise him to new heights of power, but is wholly unwilling to watch Yusuke make the same sacrifice on his behalf. Kuwabara's sense of self and ultimate worth are tied to his friendship with Yusuke, so if Yusuke isn't there, who would he even be anymore? It brings the scene from the first episode, as well as the moment from the Dark Tournament, full circle. You're supposed to be here... for me. You always gotta be there, you're messy, can't you get it? If you're not, then who am I? Since we begins beating the ever-loving hell out of Yusuke as he gears up to kill him, causing tensions to rise within Team Yurameshi as they're forced to watch and reconcile with their own weakness. With a reminder from Matari about how he defeated him in the first place, Kuwabara finally understands that his new sword could free them from the spirit beast they were trapped inside and potentially save Yusuke. After digging through his memories and recalling all of the things the duo have survived together, Kuwabara at last manages to summon the Jigen Toe and frees them all from Itsuki's pet. Unfortunately, they free themselves too late and Sensui lands the killing blow on Yusuke. The aftermath of Yusuke's death is punctuated by these somber sequences of Yusuke moving from the foreground of a frame into the background, symbolic of his going away. The imagery has always stuck with me in how it visualizes how we process the concept of losing a loved one. It's become the default way for me to picture the departure of someone I knew. Not necessarily like they don't exist anymore, but like they've gone far away to a place we can't follow just yet. Kuwabara initially falls right into the denial stage and cracks jokes to cover the mounting grief and anxiety whirling inside him. It's only when he checks for Yusuke's heartbeat that he understands Yusuke isn't putting on an act as a way to get back at Kuwabara for faking his death during the Dark Tournament. Initially, when I first made it to this section as an adult, I genuinely hoped that Yusuke was going to stay dead. Not because I didn't like him, but because I thought that narratively, a conflict regarding the fates and legacies of the spirit detectives was the perfect time for the torch to be passed to someone like Kuwabara, who's been there from the beginning anyway. Thematically, it would have been brilliant for Yusuke to continue proving Sensui wrong in death by having Kuwabara take up the mantle and honor Yusuke's memory by protecting human world himself. We could have wrapped up Kuwabara's personal arc by having him step out of Yusuke's shadow and into the role of leader and new spirit detective. Yusuke allowed himself to be killed because he trusted his friends would grow powerful enough through their grief to do what he couldn't and stop Sensui. Now, more than ever, this would have been an opportune time to make good on what Matari said earlier in the arc, how Kuwabara is stronger and more capable than anyone seemed to give him credit for. That doesn't happen, and instead, we transition into the final stretch of Chapter Black that's easily the most divisive among the fanbase. <laughs> With Yusuke dead, the tunnel to Demon World stabilizes and opens. The trio, with a new flame lit underneath them, go after Sensui with both Kurama and Hiei's power jumping exponentially and catapulting them out of the B class and firmly into the A class. I don't think we ever get a real barometer for where Kuwabara's strength lies, which is a bit of a shame to me. 
Since we hitch his ride on Hiei's Dragon of the Darkness Flame, which takes him into the portal and incinerates all of the demons waiting at the entrance. Team Urameshi is in hot pursuit, and when they finally catch up to their enemy, he's already on the other side of the Kakai barrier. Because the net was only designed to filter out demon energy, Sensui's sacred energy was allowed to pass unrestricted. The barrier is only sensitive to the energy of A and S class demons. However, that now meant that neither Karama nor Hiei could pass through anymore. Their spike in power fueled by the death of Yusuke inadvertently trapped them on the human side of the net, meaning that unless Kuwabara willingly sliced open the barrier, they could no longer pursue Sensui. Under normal circumstances with cooler heads prevailing, Team Urameshi could have cut their losses and taken the W. Technically, in order to triumph, Sensui still needs the barrier open, but all the trio needed to do in order to subvert a nightmare scenario at this point was simply leave Sensui B. Their best course of action would have been to simply hunker down in front of the portal's entrance and run damage control for any demons that made it through until the tunnel could be sealed. But as we've all experienced, people don't think clearly when their emotions are running wild especially when those emotions are rooted in anger, regret, and sorrow. Like with everything else in his scheme, since we was counting on the emotional distress of Kuwabara in particular, who would selfishly tear open the net in order to seek revenge. It plays out exactly like that and Kuwabara slices open the barrier. It's worth noting that neither Kurama nor Hiei attempt to prevent him from doing so. They're also driven by their need to avenge Yusuke that they've essentially forgotten that the barrier being broken was Sensui's main goal from the start. The boys face off against Sensui for the last time, and while we know that Kuwabara and Kurama are compassionate people in general, for Hiei, this marks the first time that he's been willing to die for someone other than himself. They all realize that even with their boost in power, Sensui may be a foe that they're incapable of defeating. But with Yusuke's death weighing on them as a constant reminder of what it is they're all fighting for, they'd sooner die than give up. So, I'm not really going to spend time covering the first half of the final fight with Sensui because honestly it's just him kicking the piss out of our boys in various ways, so we'll circle back around to it when the second half begins. Back in Spirit World, Botan updates King Yama on the situation as instructed by Kawenma, who decides to pull Yusuke off the case and call in his personal soldiers, the Spirit Defense Force. We get our first hint that something isn't quite right when the king says, my son made a very grave error when he recruited that spirit detective. Given the entirety of the arc thus far, it's reasonable to conclude he means Sensui, and that's the assumption Botan makes as well, but the king's reply casts doubt on that conclusion. Over with Keiko and Shizuru, who've mostly been irrelevant the entire arc, Pooh falls still and goes cold in the wake of Yusuke biting the dust. Soon he begins to emit a bright light and floats away from the pair. A little later after that, Pooh transforms into a giant creature and proceeds towards Demon Door Cave. Down below, Koenma notes how strange it is that even though Yusuke is dead, his ghost has yet to rise out of him the way it did at the beginning of the series. Under normal circumstances, his ghost would pop out immediately, but his soul just seemed to be MIA. Before he can put much more thought into it, the SDF arrives on the scene and takes charge. Three members are tasked with standing guard at the Kakai barrier and killing anything that attempts to pass through, three are tasked with closing up the tunnel, and the remaining two alongside the leader address Koenma. The leader conveys that the SDF's prime objective, handed down to him by the king himself, is to terminate Yusuke. According to the king, Yusuke is a direct descendant of the Mazuku, or the half-breed. Of course, Koenma protests that possibility, mentioning that he verified both Yusuke's parents were human. His grandparents and great-grandparents were also human, but if you continue tracing his family lineage, you find the deviation in his family tree. The reason this deviation has appeared in Yusuke, but none of his ancestors, comes down to what is called an atavism. For those who aren't aware, an atavism is a modification of biological structure whereby an ancestral genetic trait reappears after having been lost through evolutionary change in previous generations. And the Mazuku, in this case, can deliberately transmit its DNA recessively until it happens upon a descendant strong enough to succeed it. The first time Yusuke died, he wasn't strong enough for the Mazuku's DNA to activate, so when he was revived after his trials, he returned as a human. However, through his many adventures as Spirit Detective, he's built up the strength necessary to allow the recessive gene to awaken upon his second death. To prevent that, the SDF needs to destroy Yusuke's corpse. During this explanation, Yusuke's body begins to levitate and give off intense demon energy. The SDF fires on Yusuke, but the newly transformed Pooh arrives to shield him as he awakens. So this is the story beat that rubbed a lot of fans the wrong way. A lot of people felt as though Yusuke having demon ancestry and essentially becoming one was an uninspired route to take for his character. While I didn't particularly hate it, I can understand why it would annoy some longtime fans for one of three reasons. A, some of the people who strongly dislike this plot twist may feel this way depending on what era they watch the show in. There's a ton of anime out there where the main protagonist has some sort of crazy darkness hidden in them that gives them a much needed power boost to defeat a big bad. 
If you watched a lot of new age anime before finding Yu Yu Hakusho, I can see how this would feel played out and somewhat derivative. But to those people, I'd say remember that this story predates those by a pretty wide margin. B. Having Yusuke be the direct descendant of a powerful demon kind of robs him of his accomplishments in a metaphorical way. Part of what made Yusuke so intolerable to plenty of demons he's crossed paths with was the fact that he was so uncharacteristically strong for a human. He'd built up such a massive reputation that he became something of a boogeyman to those who would seek to cause trouble in the human world. There's power in being from a race perceived as weak by demons only to curb stomp so many well-known players. To find out that part of his achievements can be somewhat attributed to his heritage retroactively cheapens his history for a lot of fans. Not to mention, this new heritage further separates him from Kuwabara, who is already the weakest character in Team Yurameshi. And this separation runs even deeper in the next arc which I will absolutely not be doing a video essay on. And see, for a lot of people, it just seemed like a really obvious curveball coming. I wouldn't go so far as to say it breaks the experience or ruins it, but it is a revelation that people love, hate, or just tolerate depending on who you ask. Anyway, Yusuke pokes fun at the SDF before he and Kalima take off to reunite with Team Yurameshi in Demon World. You really should wash your feet more often, Yusuke. While Yusuke's transformation into a demon can be irksome for a few people, it does add some genuinely engaging shifts in the dynamic from a narrative perspective. Think about what's happened here. Since we as a human fighting to liberate demons and eliminate humans, while Yusuke is now a half-demon that fights on behalf of the human world, both men carry the title Spirit Detective and both are now unqualified to carry that title. You can't tell me that's not intriguing writing. When Yusuke finally returns to aid his friends, they get a second wind, finding the strength to keep going. In fact, Yusuke's return has invigorated them to even higher levels of strength than his death did, since he actually phrases it quite nicely himself. It's one thing to be empowered by rage at the loss of your friend. It's something extraordinary to be empowered by his return. Yusuke requests that his friends leave this fight to him, and we get the first real time he vocalizes his support for the spirit detective without a hint of condescension or sarcasm. Knock him dead, Yusuke Yurameshi, but if you fail, know I've got your back. For longtime viewers, this tiny gesture is a very big deal in regard to Hiei as a character and I remember getting hyped in my chair during this little exchange. It's crazy to think that this small gesture, this super tiny payoff would be one of my favorite moments in the entire series just from how overdue it felt. Yusuke and Sensui square off. Not much to say except it's pretty neat. Just you and me now. Well, you and 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 me. In the middle of the fight, Yusuke is interrupted by a single ominous heartbeat. Unsure of what to make of it, he continues fighting. This heartbeat catches him by surprise because upon his resurrection as a half-breed, his heart wasn't beating. According to Karama though, human hearts don't beat in quite the same fashion as demon hearts. After another standoff, a second heartbeat stops Yusuke in his tracks, then another, and another. Yusuke hears Colonel Armstrong, I, I mean his ancestor, his ancestor, speaking to him telepathically who says, you don't know how to use your power. Let me show you. And he promptly takes over Yusuke's body. I'll be the first to admit, it's, um, uh, it's not my favorite of Yusuke's designs, that's for sure. Since we gets the absolute piss kicked out of him by whomever is controlling Yusuke's body, like, it's not even close to a fair fight. The one in command of his body goes to launch a massive shot from the spirit gun, but Yusuke attempts to wrestle back control. After failing to stop the spirit gun from being fired, Yusuke regains control of his body and yells for Sensui to get out of the way, much to the surprise of his allies. Sensui gets nailed by this massive attack and is sent exceedingly far away, much in the same vein as when Tagoro was sent ragdolling out of the stadium during the Dark Tournament finals. Yusuke isn't satisfied that someone else took the reins and finished the fight. To him, having that choice to kill Sensui or let him live taken away by an unknown entity undermines the victory, even though defeating Sensui was their ultimate goal to begin with. Team Yurameshi finds out that Sensui only had a month to live anyway. Sensui had a rare and terminal, but unnamed, disease that was confirmed by Dr. Kamiya, though not even he could find a way to cure it with his powers. Sensui's ultimate goal after finding out he was terminally ill was not only to judge mankind, but to make his way to Demon World where he could see the land of the creatures he'd been slaying all his life. He wanted to understand them better and by proxy understand himself better. Sensui wanted to bring down the barriers that divided humans and demons on a physical, metaphorical, and philosophical level. Dying by a demon's hands would have been penance for his sins. However, it was Yusuke that ended up manifesting what Sensui wanted all along. As he put it, First demonized in a human's body, and then humanized in a demon's. You dissolve the barriers between us in ways I never imagined. This phrase made me reflect back on Yusuke's entire journey. 
demonized and humans body was a clear allusion to just how poorly everyone in his normal life thought of and treated Yusuke with the exception of Keiko. His classmates spread rumors about him, his teachers looked for reasons to expel him and were gleeful when he died. His life was kind of a shit show. Humanized in a demon's body makes you realize just how far Yusuke has come in terms of his feats as well as his growth as a person. Throughout Chapter Black, Yusuke has become more humble and upfront about his feelings. While the SDF and spirit world's higher ups sought to destroy him out of fear of what the blood of the Mazuku might turn him into, he remained who he was and even showed compassion to his enemy in the end when it seemed as though he'd been cheated. After Sensui dies, it's unclear if his spirit ever made it to spirit world to be judged like Tagoro's was, or if his soul is an internal limbo in Itsuki's arms who took the deceased detective's body with him instead of allowing Koenma to have it. After all is said and done, even though Sensui lost his life, he still ended up succeeding in breaking the Kakai barrier. Koenma postulates that Yusuke's ancestor might still be alive somewhere in the demon world, and Yusuke assumes that must be who turned him into a puppet and killed Sensui. Yusuke becomes hellbent on finding this demon, which becomes the inciting incident and motivation for the final story arc of the show, The Three Kings. There is some last minute wrap up with the surviving members of Sensui 7, but I'm ready to stop talking, so let's just hop, skip, and jump right on over to the- Considering how much praise I heaped on the Dark Tournament in my last video, I was surprised that I walked away from this experience enjoying Chapter Black even more. I think on my initial watch, I didn't pick up on some of the themes or some of the connections went right over my head. Around the first time that I sat through this series and actually paid attention, I was in the era of my anime life where I was mostly just looking for action. Compared to the Dark Tournament, Chapter Black has far less action since the emphasis shifts more toward philosophical and moral conundrums than situations that can be solved just by punching harder. Given everything we've talked about, I want to wrap this video up with some pros and cons about Chapter Black. I'll keep this as brief as possible because this video has already been 10 years long and I'm sure you have other things you need to do today. Some pros. Sensui is a fantastic antagonist that poses a credible threat to Yusuke physically and morally. I think it was a smart move to make the antagonist of this arc a human since everyone up till now had been a demon of some sort. The soundtrack added a couple of pretty dope bops into the mix that I periodically listen to in my free time. I really loved the concept of territories, which allowed otherwise normal people to stand on the same battlefield as Team Urameshi. It rebalances the scales while emphasizing that our heroes needed to be smart in how they approached situations. The storytelling this time around felt way more sophisticated, with so many threads weaving in and out of each other in ways that harken back to earlier points in the series. Now for some cons. While I really like the plot twist of Sensui's mental disorder, I don't feel as though it was expressed enough because of how closely to the chest they were trying to keep that secret. The only real evidence of any alters was Minoru, the orator of the collective. Kazuya shows up near the finale, and we're simply told about the existence of the others. I'd have liked to see each of the seven in action in some way over the course of the arc. Again, I really love the introduction of territories, but I'd have liked to see more of their implementation. Or at the very least, I'd have liked to see Kido, Kaito, and Yana do more with their territories in the second half of the arc. Kaito literally only uses his territory once for the audience to see. Kido uses his numerous times and even gets a cool variant, and Yana gets to use his a handful of times. I think it would have been cool to see them put their powers to further use instead of just getting sidelined for nearly the entirety of the second half. Territories are a really cool concept, so I think it would have been nice if the prelude had focused on the obvious confusion and chaos that would have inherently come with a bunch of random people suddenly discovering they had powers. I wasn't necessarily a fan of Hiei vanishing for the first half of the arc. At the very least, I'd have liked to see what he was doing while he was away from Team Urameshi, especially if he'd had his own fight to concern himself with. Hiei is the only one in Team Urameshi this time around that doesn't get a solo fight of his own, and I find that very weird. I know part of the reason he was removed from the story up to a certain point was because he has no problem killing his enemies, human or not, but I'd have appreciated it more if he genuinely had other matters to deal with, or if we got to see him toil over the decision to finally help stop Sensui instead of him just showing up in the 11th hour of Yusuke's fight with Sniper and ending it himself. Overall, I would definitely have to restructure my opinion and put Chapter Black above the Dark Tournament by just a fraction of a point. They both offer their own things that may appeal to different pockets of the fanbase, but they're both fantastic pieces of anime history. While I did go a bit more in-depth this time around just because of how much context matters in this arc, I did leave out quite a bit, so if your favorite moment wasn't mentioned or if there were other takeaways you had from certain scenes, let me know in the comments below. Before we go, I want to follow up on what I said at the beginning of the video about this video almost being sponsored by Loot Crate. So I completely forgot that I have a business email associated with this channel, and about a month and a half ago I woke up to an email 
from a representative from Loot Crate. I'm naturally skeptical about random emails offering odds and ends, and this one seemed a bit sus at first. But after I did my due diligence, it turns out that it was, in fact, an actual representative from Loot Crate. Now, in the past, I always thought Loot Crate sounded pretty cool. A monthly box full of random nerdy knickknacks? That seemed pretty dope to someone like me. So I got in contact with the representative, and they got me rolling with their partner program. Honestly, from the position of a small content creator, I was hyped. I was like, cool, I'll get a discount for my viewers, and they get to get cool crates, and I get a free crate to show it off and they get to support the channel, and not to mention, sponsored videos just feel more legit, you know? But in my excitement, there was something in the back of my mind that told me to do more research. You know that little skeptic we all have in the back of our minds? Mine was sounding the alarm and shouting a single question through a loudspeaker. When was the last time you saw a Loot Crate sponsored video? The more I thought on it, the more it bugged me because I started to realize that I hadn't seen any Loot Crate related videos in like 6 months to a year, maybe 18 months? It's like it's been a hot minute. As I dug deeper, I started to see why. Loot Crate doesn't have the best reputation these days, and that's putting it very generously. They've been known to, allegedly, take people's money, but not send the crates on time, if at all, send people the wrong crates, and then when people contact customer service to get things sorted out, they get the runaround. On top of that, They've been known to make it exceptionally hard for people to cancel their subscriptions when they're unsatisfied. The list goes on, there's no shortage of complaints about this company. Once I started seeing all this, I had to rethink my personal involvement. While I don't have the biggest audience by any stretch of the imagination, I didn't feel comfortable potentially putting my viewers in the very real position of potentially being finessed out of money or inconvenienced by Loot Crate. I didn't like the idea of someone trusting my advertisement and shelling out money for a crate only to end up dealing with the same nightmare scenarios as plenty of others before them. If I'm going to push a product for a company, I want to wholeheartedly believe in that product. And at the moment, I don't believe in Loot Crate, so I took a step back and declined the offer. You what? At the very least, if there comes a time in the future where I do end up shilling for a different company or product, then you'll know beyond a shadow of a doubt that at the bare minimum, I've done the research. But anyway, I've talked long enough I need two gallons of water and a 10 year nap. Like I said earlier, I don't intend to do a video essay for the Three Kings arc of Yu Yu Hakusho. I do have something else planned for that, but it's not going to be a video essay, so please don't get your hopes up. Thanks again for having the patience to wait for this video to come out. It was a long time coming, and I honestly didn't expect it to take quite this long. On top of the delays, I do apologize for that, but there's been a lot going on in my life, as there I'm sure there is with lots of you. So again, just... Thank you for your patience. I do intend to go back to a regular upload schedule now that this video is done. I do have ideas for what I want to do next that should take less time to produce and also allow me to upload more frequently, so be on the lookout for that. That being said, I am also looking for an editor once again. If you want to put your name into the hat, just send it to my business email, it's on my channel. Uh, send me a link to your channel or some of your work so I can see if we're compatible because that is kind of important to me and we can discuss pay rates, yada yada yada, the whole nine yards. Having an editor would take a big chunk of the workload off of myself so that I can produce more frequently. Also, I've started a Patreon for those who feel inclined to support the channel more, which will also allow me to spend more time making content. Uh, you can check all that out in the description below the link to the discord's in the description below and for the discord it's been there for several months but i've just been so busy that it's basically been inactive so i'm going to put in an effort to actually be on discord and interact so if you feel like joining the discord feel free there's already nobody there uh, so you'll be among the first but i am very much reachable through discord more than literally any other platform i frequent because we all know that I'm never on Twitter. I really need to stop pushing Twitter in my videos. Remember to take care of yourselves and others. The world is still kind of going crazy right now, so please be safe. This is Saturn signing out, and as always, thanks for watching.